Yeah. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, how about in Zoom land? Raise your hand. All right. I'm Gordon Lepig. I'm the co-chair for conservation and the workshop chair of the North Coast chapter. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vargas. Uh, but before I do so, I have an important announcement. Many of you folks are aware of the California's botanical and ecological splendor, right? We all know that California has the highest and lowest points in the lower 48, that we have the third longest coastline outside of Alaska and Florida, that we have the most national parks, the most wilderness areas of any state, The most, um, the most diverse uh, conifer assemblage outside of the Himalayas. We have the largest state flora of over 7,000 taxa, the largest amount of endemism, over 2,000 species. A third of the state flora is endemic. What am I missing? Oh, the largest, the tallest, and the oldest trees on earth occur in California. So we all know how important California is botanically, uh, how much we have to conserve, to protect, to understand, to celebrate, and nowhere more so than on the North Coast. But what you may not be aware of is that there is a botanical prize, the highest prize in the state of California. Uh, the, the, how would you put it? The, the, um, the, uh, wait for it the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Botanical Hall of Fame. And that is for folks that have, should I talk lower oh. or step back? For folks that have devoted years of their life to protecting and uh, California native plants and promoting their understanding and, um, and appreciation. Uh, and the name of that prize is the CNPS Fellow. And to quote uh, the CNPS Codex, becoming a fellow is the highest recognition CNPS awards to members. These members have accumulated extraordinary accomplishments toward the understanding, appreciation, and preservation of California native plants. We celebrate their achievements by honoring them as CNPS fellows. And with that introduction, I invite Carol Ralph over here as our newest CNPS fellow and to recognize her for her decades of service to CNPS and to the California flora. There it is. Uh, so Carol, you can look busy, hide behind that because I know this is humiliating. Oh, oh there it is. Okay, so. Uh, we have a presentation tonight, and so I, you know, there's, Carol has so many accomplishments that we can't go through them all tonight, but it's important to know that she got involved in the California Native Plant Society in the North Coast chapter in the late 90s, as near as I can tell. She served as chapter secretary and as chapter treasurer for a number of years, and she has been president of this chapter since 2003, 20 years. Um, about half of the chapter's <laughs> existence, more than every other president of the chapter combined. You think you kick me out? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, as well as being president, she has co led or led, really led, over 20, uh, to, over 200 field walks and, um, and field trips and plant walks. She has written over 200 articles for our newsletter, uh, Darlingtonia, including plant highlights, 
field notes, conservation reports, book reviews, and president's columns. Carol has conducted many dozens, uh, countless native plant consultations. And on top of her relentless duties as president and all these other accomplishments, she's been a major organizer of the annual spring wildflower show, uh, engaged in all facets of chapter work, including our native plant nursery, plant sales, conservation, and education. So on a personal note, I, I just wanna say that uh, we have a very strong, effective, uh, energetic chapter made up of dozens of active volunteers. We have a wonderful group. And if you're looking to volunteer, this is an effective place to do it. But all effective teams need effective leaders, organized leaders with vision, yet who are resilient and patient, someone knowledgeable yet humble, a leader with great passion and commitment who is also empathic and fun to work with. That's you. Uh, one and one. <laughs> I'm going to shut up soon. And, and one who can run effective meetings and make decisions. Carol embodies all of that. She has the strength of an oak, the wisdom of a redwood, and her enthusiasm is rhizomatous. Should I say invasive? I don't know. Let's say rhizomatous. So with that, on behalf of the chapter, on behalf of the California Native Plant Society, and on behalf of the Native Plants of California, we thank you for all your work and congratulate you on your fellowship, and we love you. Honored and proud. Oh my, this is. I want to just inject here. This is a beautiful golden darling pony that Karen is on the Karen's back here on the on the merchandise table. It was made by Karen and given to Carol from all the volunteers at the nursery and all the other volunteers at our chapter. So come admire this. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming to the mic party. <laughs> I'm really honored, and I'm really proud of my certificate. It's a lot. And I really enjoy this magnificent sculpture that Karen and David made for me. I think of it, oh, well, it's, it's beautiful. And to me, it, it speaks for the chapter that we have a beautiful, magnificent chapter. Thank you. Okay, it's it's just my night for oration, because now I get to introduce Professor Vargas, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Vargas, Professor of Botany at Cal Poly Humble. Got that right. Um, Dr. Vargas um, grew up in Colombia. He got his undergraduate and his master's degrees from the Universidad de los uh, Andes. He took his PhD from the University of Texas in, uh, in Austin. He did two post-graduate, uh, postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Michigan and also at UC Santa Cruz. And he landed here in 2020 at the height of the COVID pandemic, where uh, like heroically, masterfully, uh, creatively, he taught plant taxonomy online for what, a year or more? Uh, yeah. yeah, crazy, but he did this. Um, he backfills uh, Professor uh, Michael Messler, uh, who retired recently. Um, I, in the last uh, two years, I've got had the pleasure to lurk about the uh, Cal Poly Herbarium, where uh, Dr. Vargas's office is, and he is also the director of the herbarium. So a shout out to the Cal Poly Herbarium. Use it. Love it. In being there, I've gotten to know Dr. Vargas and interact with him and some of his students some. 
And I can say that his laboratory is, a, is an energetic beehive of folks. There are students, there are plants, there are specimens, there are DNA all wafting about. So tonight we look forward to hearing about his past and current research. And I can say that I think in the coming uh, decades, we all look forward to his innovative research coming out of his laboratory that will help us better understand, conserve, and, um, and manage California's native plants. So with that, Dr. Vargas. All right, thank you. Everybody. <laughs> All right. Okay, I think that works. I don't see myself, but I um, think that works. All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me here. I'm pretty excited to tell you a little bit about my past research, um, my present research, and my future research. And um, so the title of my talk is From the Neotropics to California, to the California Forestic Province of Plant Journey Seeking to Understand Plant Diversification. All right, so this is the outline for my talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about a very special ecosystem in the Andes of South America. It's uh, the ecosystem that is really close to my heart, which is the Paramo ecosystem. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research that I've been doing there uh, to understand plant diversification in this amazing ecosystem. And then um, the third part of my presentation is going to be devoted about the research that I'm doing here uh, with my students. All this research is, is driven by them. So if you have questions about the research, you can ask them. I think some of them are, are around. All right, so I really like to start my presentation with this um, slide. Uh, and this slide is showing the accumulation of plant species in the world. So basically what you can see is that warmer colors are going to indicate a higher accumulation of plant species. So we can see that some areas are, have uh, more than 5,000 species in 10,000 square kilometers. When we look at the warmer colors, colors here, we can see that these colors are usually associated with the tropics, right? So um, we can see that these warmer colors really close to the tropics here, but we can also see that some of these colors are also associated with regions that have mountains or some sort of topographic complexity. So we can see here these colors, these red colors in South America, um, really close to the Andes, these red colors in Brazil, close to the Mata Atlantica. We can also see red colors um, in the Tibet, in the mountains around here. And if we look at California, we can also see that we have purple here. So we have the California floristic province is up here, it's purple. We have a lot of species there. And we also have mountains here. Um, you probably were here for the presentation, Mike, about the climate region and how special this is. So I'm going to be talking mostly about all the diversity that is present in this area of Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru um, that shows high species richness. All right, so if we zoom into this area of Colombia and Ecuador, um, in the map that you see to the right, you're gonna see a digital elevation model. So basically, um, darker colors are going to indicate higher elevations. And on the mountains, I have overlaid a map of the Paramo ecosystem. Um, the Paramo ecosystem is a tropical mountain ecosystem. It's found above the tree line, um, above 3,000 meters, which is around 10,000 feet. So it's high elevation. So to get there, you have to pass uh, the Andean forest, the cloud forest, and then you get to a sort of an open space, but it is an open space that is really burdened with a lot of plants. 
Um, because we're in the tropics, and um, because this area of Colombia is influenced by uh, multiple um, climate regions, there is a lot of precipitation in this area. So there is, there is water around the year all the time. We're gonna see a graph that shows this. And then as you can see, the patches of the Paramo are indicated by orange colors. You can see that this distribution is sort of patchy. It kind of look like islands, like an archipelago. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a little hike here um, and we're gonna put our boots and start hiking just before the park. So what we can see here in the picture is basically in the left, you are gonna see the Andean forest. So we're going to see a lot of um, trees, small trees, dwarf trees, um, many shrubby species. And then we're gonna go up to the mountains towards the right. And then you're gonna see how about the center here, we have some sort of valley and we can see how the density of trees and shrubs start to diminish. And then we start to have this sort of open habitat that we call the paramount. If we keep going up and then we're gonna get to a point that we're in this open habitat from far away, it looks just like a huge grassland, but when you are on it, I'm, I'm sitting of the Paramo here, you can see that there is a lot of diversity of species in this area. I really like this picture because this picture shows that the division between the forest and the grassland and the Paramo is not a straight line. We can see here in the center, there is a creek running in this valley, and we can see how there is forest surrounding this uh, creek. So really cool, a lot of trees here, and then we can see all this amazing vegetation in these open areas. If we keep going up, uh, there is going to be a point in which you don't see forest anymore. All you see is this vast region of paramos. Um, Colombia is the region that has the most paramos in the world in terms of area. And you see this amazing, landscape with these really amazing plants and really weird um, morphologies that we can see here. I can tell you from far away, this, this patch here is actually a patch of giant uh, lupines out there. Um, so these are more pictures of the Paramo. Um, so as I mentioned before, there is a lot of precipitation. So we're going to find a lot of water. Um, we're going to have a lot of herbaceous plants. We're going to have a lot of shrubs. And uh, something that we are really familiar with here in Humboldt, a lot of fog and a lot of rain also in the Paramo. So this is in front thing. More water, a lot of grasses too. And then at some point you start getting so high that the plants start to become a little bit smaller. It starts to get a little bit more drier for plants. The diversity starts going down. This is a picture of a Parque Podocarpus in Ecuador. So this is the top of a mountain uh, in Ecuador. And this grass that you can see here is actually a, a bamboo that is really small, really short bamboo. <clears throat> And this, if you keep going enough, there is actually places that they don't, do not have a lot of coverage. Um, you can see this valley here. This is all Paramo here, but this is so high. This is probably 4,500 meters. There is almost no vegetation here. So there is a lot of soil exposed, but we still have some plants here in the Paramo. Um, sometimes these areas are called the super Paramo. Because they are very high. All right, so uh, the Paramo has some uh, physiological challenges to plants. Um, so even though we have a lot of precipitation during the year, and there is a daily variation in temperature that plants have to deal with. And you can think as the Paramo as a place in which we have summer every day and winter every night. So during the day, it can get to the 70s, the 70s, 
um, Fahrenheit, but then at night it can get to freezing. So plants have to deal with this temperature. There is this, there is high UV and high winds. Um, because it is cold, because of the wind, because of the temperature, that means that the paramo is physiologically dry for plants. Um, here we can um, look at this graph of precipitation in the year. So this graph is going to have in the X axis, going to have the months. Then you are going to have two graphs in one. So on the left, you are going to see the temperature in Celsius, the average temperature during the months. And this is um, illustrated by this red line here. And then in blue, you are going to see, so this is the other y-axis, you are going to see the precipitation. In general, plant ecologists say that the rule of thumb here is that when the line of precipitation goes under this red line of average temperature is where you have high stress of water. This is not present in the paramo. There is no high stress of water in the paramo um, because of this precipitation that arrives to this ecosystem. And that's why it is so rich and so green. Um, the Paramo actually made it to the New York Times a couple of years ago. Um, there was a paper describing uh, the rapid speciation that has happened in the Paramo. So um, they discovered that the Paramo has the fastest speciation rates in the world. Uh, there is almost 4,000 species of vascular plants more than 60% of these plants are endemic, and all those are in 127 families and 540 genera. Uh, when we look at the numbers, uh, this is how they look. So this is also a table with lichen, mosses, uh, vascular plants. So we can see the numbers here. This is from Lutein 1999. Uh, we can see that uh, I think we just have one angiosperm, it's Apollocarpus, something similar. Um, but a lot of diversity in total for all the plants, including non-vascular and vascular plants, we have almost 5,000 species of plants out there. So I guess for comparison, um, the California Floristic Province, it's uh, basically eight times larger than the paramo, uh, yet it contains only uh, double of the plants that we find in the paramo. All right, this is another table. I'm not gonna go over all the tables, but this is a table that shows uh, the number of genera and species, so which families are very rich in the paramo. And you, if you have done surveys here in California, you probably are familiar with these families. Um, many families in the Paramo that are very rich are also rich here in a non-tropical ecosystem. So we have Asteraceae is the family with the most species in the Paramo. Then we have Poaceae, the grasses, so Asteraceae, sunflower family, then Poaceae, the grasses, and then Orchidaceae, the orchids. So, all these numbers are pretty cool, but we want to see the plants. Um, I just wanted to mention these are uh, the most common life forms in the Paramo. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go to pictures of plants um, that are separated by the different life forms. So we're going to have a lot of rosettes. Many of those rosettes are cowlescent, like my background here. So they are going to have a stem and then they have a crown of leaves. Then I'm gonna talk about the grasses. Then I'm gonna show some uh, oil roses, some herbaceous plants, and then finally some shrubs. All right, so let's start with some roses. Um, this is a, a monocot. Uh, it's called Pepalanthus, and it's basically sort of like a grass. It kind of looks like a bromelia, uh, pretty cool in the family Eriocaulaceae. These are sometimes called um, the composite of the monocot because the flowers are in these, flowers are really small and they are grouped in this dense head. Um, this is probably the most iconic plant 
of the paramo and I wanted to see if you can get the family for this plant. Asteraceae. Asteraceae, that's correct. So if we look at a picture of the flowers, uh, this is closely related with the sunflower. In fact, uh, the inflorescences look pretty much like a sunflower. Um, when these plants flower in the paramo, they usually tend to flower at the same time. It's just amazing to see all these paramos uh, flowers um, at the same time. Um, some of these species actually made it to the high Andean forest. Uh, this is um, Espeletia indigenous. It's a complex of more than 100 species. And we can see this one is a species that is actually found in the Andean forest, so really close to the paramo, but not quite. They tend to be a little bit skinnier and really tall because they're competing with the trees uh, next to them. Uh, more roses. So this is a picture of me uh, when I was younger and didn't have glasses. Uh, and um, this is a giant bromelia, uh, the genus Puya in the bromeliaceae, the flowers of these plants are really cool. So what this plant does is um, it basically saves sugar to, uh, throughout its life. And it only flowers once and produces a giant inflorescence. This inflorescence is in fact the favorite food of the Andean spectacle bear. So in the center of the inflorescence, you are going to have a pit that is, uh, has a lot of sugar, basically like a pineapple. And then that's what the bear looking for. Um, there are some extreme plants. Um, these are called um, paramo pillows, I guess. Um, and these are plants that grow in places that have a lot of water. So um, wetland areas in these high ecosystems. So this is this tikia in the intensity. And basically you can step in these things. These things are really hard, like a mat, feels like a mat. And there is a place in Colombia that is uh, really special. It is called the Valley of the Pillows, I guess if I translate that to English, but it's just uh, filled with all these different pillows filled by these plants. Um, more plants, more rosettes. Um, you probably have seen valerianas around California. Um, the ones that are in California are usually herbaceous. Some of these plants have become a roset up there, have really different shapes to the ones that we know outside of the bottom. So no valeriana, also just sort of uh, being really plump and really dense. Some of these mats or some of these pillows um, are also in the Asteraceae. So this is Werneria in the Asteraceae. And it's amazing to see how a monocot that is almost a grass can be so similar to this Asteraceae in the sunflower family. A lot of convergent evolution to these extreme life shapes. Uh, so bunch forming plants. So we have many grasses up there. So Chusquea is one of those. So this is relative of the bamboo. This is a couple of meter tolls. Um, really, really dense sometimes. Uh, the most common plant, at least one that is dominant throughout the landscape, is just, is uh, Calamancurostis effusa in the Poaceae. That's the most common grass up there. Huh. Cortadeira nitida for ACE, which is uh, closely, closely related to the pampas grass that we have around that is invasive that we don't like, but this one is native to the paramo. Uh, shrubs. Um, we have pretty cool shrubs up in the paramo. This is one of my favorite ones. This is Loricaria in the sunflower family. We can see that this plant uh, has really tiny leaves and it almost resembles a coral. Uh, Monina in the polygalaceae. So we can see the shrub here. We can see the flowers there. 
Um, can you get the family for this? So Eric Casey, so we have many, many, many Eric Casey in the park. So especially when you are leaving the Andean forest and getting into the proper paramo, you are gonna see what we call the belt of ericaceous plants, uh, many ericaceae. There, this is specifically the genus Thibaudia in ericaceae. Uh, a lot of edibles. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, um, there are some, yeah. So if they are in the tribe Baxini E, uh, where Baxinium belongs to, there are some some of those that are edible, yeah. Um, so this is another plant that we can find in the palm. Can you get the genus? Have you seen this plant? Yeah, this is Berberis, yeah. So this is Berberis in the Berberi Daisy E. Um, so you can see that the Paramo or the Andean region has a lot of connections with California and with non-tropical ecosystem. This is another of my favorite plants up there. This is a parasitic plant uh, that parasitizes our plants from the root. Um, it is an hemiparasitic, meaning that it can also produce its own uh, photosynthesis, but it's connected to other plants. It's called Gaia dendron punctatum in the Laurentaceae. Um, Hypericum is also made it there, many species in the paramo. Um, Calcellaria, many species in the paramo too. Uh, we don't have these here in the wild, but there are some houses here in Arcata that have this as a ornamental plant. Aragoa, uh, in the family Plantaginaceae, we know that this family contains many things that look very different from each other, but the common name for this plant is the little pine of the paramo, because you can see the leaves are linear. It sort of looks like a pine, but of course, this is an angiosperm. It has flowers. This is also a very common genus in the paramo, and I wanted to see if you can recognize it. Baccaris, yeah, that's right, Baccaris. So I say that Baccaris should be the genus that represent the Americas. It's basically everywhere, everywhere, many species. And uh, this is probably the most beautiful shrub in the Paramo, Linochilus aeroporus. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of these shrubs in the next section of my talk. <clears throat> right, so what's the genus for this? So this is a uh, looping. Uh, so remember that patch I showed you? Uh, this is that patch. This specific one is pretty big. This inflorescence that we have here could be this high. So many, 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 many flowers. And the really cool thing about um, the lupins is that they're very diverse. And this is a tiny one that is not larger than a dime. So very tiny ones, very large ones. Uh, Gentiana, this one is also a really, really tiny plant. Um, Arcytopilum in the Rubiaceae, very tiny plant too. Um, you probably have seen this around. What's the family or genus for this? Yes, this is Castilleja, that's correct, many species that we have there in the Paramo too. They made it there. They are also parasitic plants. And can you get the genus for this? Look at this flower. <coughs> yes, so it is another one case. This is a pedicularis. Um, this is actually the only species that made it to the Paramo. So we have only one species of pedicularis and I was really happy to see it in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we also have a lot of orchids out there. This is just a couple that I wanted to show you. Um, many orchids in the Paramo are terrestrial, um, but we, of course we have a lot of orchids um, next to the Paramo in the Andean forest that are epiphytic. 
All right, so I wanted to show you all this eye candy for you to look at the diversity of plants that we can see there. But now we're gonna enter into the science of it. How can we test or understand how diversity um, evolved in the panel? Can we understand it? So I'm gonna talk about testing speciation mo modes in woody asters or woody daisies, which are the plants that I studied for my PhD. So when I started my PhD, and even before I started my PhD, I decided to study the genus Diplostephium. Um, there is not a single name that can describe all these species, a common name. So I, I, named, I renamed them the woody daisies or the woody asters. Uh, they are all over the place. There are more than 111 species, and they are distributed all the way from Colombia to Peru. You can see that some of these plants are very large. Um, so you can see myself here next to one of these small trees. Um, so this is really close to the Andean forest. When you go a little bit up in, eleva in elevation, you enter to the proper paramo. They are going to be troughs like these ones here. But then when you get really high in elevation, they're gonna be really small and woody. They are gonna look basically like a bonsai. You can see my clippers here and you can see the plant here, very woody. Um, you can see the heads here. They all really look like daisies and there's a lot of diversity here. So what I wanted to do for my PhD was to study these plants, um, build a phylogeny of these plants. So understand how they are related to each other and then understand how they evolve. Um, so we can see more pictures of this plant here, and then we can see here the distribution. So this is South America. In yellow, we have the Central Andes, and then in green, we have the Northern Andes. So there is a little bit of a division between the mountains there, and we can even see that there is a couple of species in Central America. So I went to the field, collected many of these species, went back to Texas, sequenced the DNA of more than 90 species, uh, 90 species, yeah, I included many other genera um, that are closely related to these woody daisies and built a phylogeny. And then what I discovered with the phylogeny is that the woody daisies are not a natural group. So uh, what you can see here is that the woody daisies are divided into groups. And these two groups are defined by an ancestor, and that ancestor gave rise to all these different species. So what that means is that um, we didn't have one group, we had two groups. So I, in a sense, I unravel a new genus of plants that was overlooked in the Andes. So um, just for you that are no biologists, uh, we call natural groups that are a descendant from a single ancestor, a monophyletic group. Um, and we know that if we follow the rules of nomenclature, the names should follow monophyletic groups or natural groups. So then um, what I did was I had to rename. So the type of species uh, fell into this clade, into this group that is mostly uh, in Peru and Ecuador. So that means that the species that were present in Colombia needed to be um, removed into a different name. So the new name for this species is now Linochius. So now we have the woody daisies are split into two different genera, Linochilus and Diplostephium. The wonderful story about this is that when you look at the biogeography, these two groups make a lot of sense. Um, there is one group that is mostly Northern Andean, and then there is another group, Diplostephium, that is mostly Central Andean. And we know from geologists that uh, around this area here, this was the last part of the Andes to get up. Uh, so there was a gap here. So there is uh, this line here basically represents a biogeographical barrier for many groups of plants and birds. Um, there is also some morphological characteristics that divide these two groups. Uh, the papus is a little bit different in Linochilus and 
um, between Linochilus and Diplostephium. And also the architecture of the trees, the way they grow is a little bit different. I'm not gonna go into those details. Um, another way of looking at this is looking at a phylogenetic network. So again, we can see uh, the beauty about the phylogenetic network is that it shows um, where there is not a lot of resolution in the phylogeny of the relationship between the species. But here it clearly shows that we have two different groups that are originated independently. And all these names here are different genera. Bacaris, for example, it's here. Um, so it's really two different groups that we have here. So um, when I discovered that, I was pretty excited um, about the discovery. It made a lot of sense. I couldn't believe it at the beginning because I always thought it was a single group. But then when I wanted to do my last, the last chapter of my dissertation, I needed to pick one of those two groups to really test the hypothesis. And because the Plostephion is mostly in the central Andes, I stay with a Linochilus that is present in the proper paramo, which I know better. And I had more data because I actually started working with the woody daisies since my master's. So, um, if we um, take a look of Linochilus itself, um, we have a total of 63 species, and this is still makes this genus the third most diverse genus in the Paramo. Uh, there are species that are in the forest, so in the cloud forest, like we can see here. There are species that are in the proper Paramo, like all these species here, and then there are some species that are in the super Paramo. Um, the fruit here is a small akin that is going to have some hairs, and then that's going to help this plant to be dispersed. So what I wanted to do just with this group is I wanted with this group to understand why is the paramo so diverse. And I wanted specifically to understand why is Linochilus so diverse. So in order to test this hypothesis, we have to uh, think about the possible scenarios that produce new species in these mountains. So we go back to the map of the Paramos, we go back to this archipelago-like system, and uh, we can think of a species that is found in all these little islands that are marked here by A. So our species is there, is growing, they're happy. We know that the winds in South America go mostly from east to west. And we can think as some seeds maybe being dispersed by this area. So what's gonna happen, something like this, we have a dispersion event to this different area. And now we have a population of this original species here and a population of this species here. If time passes and then these, these populations are isolated genetically, then we are going to have two different species after maybe um, half million year or a million year. So if you think about this in a phylogenetic context or um, in how species are related to each other, what that means in a phylogenetic context is that the species A is gonna be sister to species B. And what you expect, if this is the most typical mode of speciation, which is geographical speciation, is that two sisters, these two species are gonna, assist, are gonna be sister to each other. So they're gonna be closely related to each other. And then they are gonna be found in different island systems or in different islands. So they are not gonna be found in the same islands. So we can expect, if this is the dominant way of speciation, we can expect all this throughout the phylogeny of the plants. Now, the other hypothesis to explain possible speciation here is parapatric ecological divergence. And this is just a fancy name to say, well, you can be adapted to a different ecosystem. You can change your ecology a little bit and that might mean uh, evolution into a new species. So we know that in the forest, we have plants, and specifically in Linochilus, 
We have plants that have pretty wide and long leaves. So the, the leaves are larger. When you go up in elevation, the leaves of these species tend to be small. So uh, you can use the leaf area as a proxy for the ecology of this species. So you have large leaves, you are most likely going to be in the lower elevations or at least closer to the fire, closer to the forest. If you have really small leaves, you are gonna be in higher elevations in more drier, physiologically dry systems. So um, what you can think that happen is that you can have a population that is growing primarily in the forest but maybe some of these species start to get locally adapted to more dry ecosystems. Maybe they are getting close to the open paramount, and then they start to evolve into getting smaller leaves. So then you can imagine um, populations that are next to each other or parapatric, in which the individuals in the higher elevations are going to have smaller leaves, but the individuals <laughs> in the lower elevations, so the ones that are closer to the forest, are going to have larger leaves. Again, if we fast forward in time, the grand experiment of the world, um, we can see that maybe we can predict that maybe we're going to end up with two species. Uh, one that adapted to the higher elevations, and now all the species, all the individuals there are going to have small leaves. And one A that was the original um, population that we have named A and has smaller leaves. So what that means in a phylogenetic context is that if this was the process of speciation, then you expect that these two species that are very closely related to each other are sister, but then they are going to show different leaf areas. And not just that, they are going to be located in the same Paramo Island. They are just sharing different elevational belts. So if this is the most common process of speciation, you expect um, all these um, closely related species to be sister to each other, to be in the same island, but to have different leaves. So the aim of that uh, evolutionary study with Linochilus was to quantify the relative contribution of ecological speciation versus geographical speciation in the phylogeny of the group. Um, so basically, this is just a little bit about the methods, uh, just to show that um, what we did for this was um, we went to the field, we collected these species, we sequenced their DNA, but in order to quantify these leaf areas, uh, we also use a lot of herbarium specimens. So um, Gordon was talking about the importance of the herbarium. I could not have done my dissertation without all the specimens that I was able to visit in different herbaria uh, in Colombia and the United States. Then um, I did phylogenetics, so you already saw these three. I calibrated the phylogeny, calculated the leaf areas, and then I used all herbarium specimens to um, map these species and test if the species were found in the same, in the same island or not. So I create a database of um, species occurrences. So this is basically what I was looking at. Um, so I identify in my phylogeny sister species. I look at their leaf area to see if they were statistically different or similar. And then I look at the distribution trying to understand if they were in the same area or in a different area. So in this, in this uh, hypothetical case, we have two sister species, A and B. One has a bigger leaf area than the other, probably indicating some sort of ecological divergence, but they're also found in different places. So you can see that uh, species A is only found in this mountain here, while this other species is found in all these different islands here. Um, meaning that in this case, we see signatures of both ecological divergence and geographical speciation. 
So basically what I did is look at all the sister species. If they are growing in different Panama islands, then I'm gonna say that there is always geographical speciation. Allopatrical speciation is important regardless of the leaf area. If they are found in the same Paramo area, then uh, I'm going to look closely at the leaves. If the leaves are different, then I'm gonna say there is evidence of ecological speciation. If the leaves are pretty similar, but they are in the same Paramo Island, well, this will be an inconclusive result. I don't really know what's happening there. So let's look at the results. So this is a very busy slide. Um, but I'm gonna walk you through it really slowly. So <laughs> on the left, we have the phylogeny. This phylogeny is calibrated by time, meaning that I can know the origin of a species or the origin of a specific group. Um, the bars here in blue represent the confidence interval for the ages of these different ancestors. So you can see that the confidence intervals are pretty wide. Uh, for example, the ancestor for the whole genus is around 6 million years old in average, but it could be as young as 2 million years old or as old as 11 million years old. So, you know, I don't want to um, tell you that that's exactly the age, the, the, uh, the, the confidence interval is pretty wide. Um, so here we have the species, and here what I have is the measurements of the leaves. So I, um, for every single species, I measure the leaves of at least five different individuals. And then what we have here is a box plot indicating how big was the distribution of the leaves there. So if the box is really close to your left, close to the names, that means that's a species with a smaller leaves. If the box is really close to your right, then you are going to have pretty big leaves that we can see here. Just by looking at the distribution of these and how a closely related species tend to have similar leaf areas, you can already see that there is some sort of um, phylogenetic conservatism, meaning things that are closely related look like each other. And that, that makes sense for us, right? Like people in the same family, they look like each other, right? So what we can see from here is that it seems that maybe the ecology between sister species is not gonna change that much. Now, what we need to know is that we need to know how many of these species are growing in different, in different Paramo Islands or not. So what you can see here, these boxes here um, in sister species first represent the comparisons. And these stars represent the cases in which um, these two species are growing in different islands. So basically when you tally up all these different comparisons that we have here in the phylogeny, you can see that um, by using uh, by looking at their ecology and their distribution, we can infer or we can conclude that 80% of these sister species pairs evolved uh, or probably diverged because of geographical isolation. So we have a high signal of geographical isolation, meaning most likely we have that a scenario in which we have dispersal or we have vicariance, but sister species are growing in different islands. We uh, don't see a lot of ecological divergence in our comparisons, just 13%, so that's not a lot. And we have some cases that are inconclusive, that is 7%. Um, on the right here, we, you can see some pictures of the leaves, how they look. So you can see this is a really, really tiny picture, really, really tiny leaf here in my hands. And you can see that here, these two species belong to this clade that, um, or this group that I named D, uh, for denticulata, they, they usually are dentate. And we can see that all these clade are plants that are found in the forest. So again, 
another indication that um, what's happening here is that closely related species are similar to each other. So basically what we have is that in most cases, we're going to have something like this. And this is some one specific case that I took from the phylogeny. We have two species, Linochidus filicoides, this is a small shrub like this tall. Um, it's sister to Linochilus lacunosus, which is a little bit larger, but you can see these two species are pretty similar to each other. The leaves are pretty similar to each other, but they live in different islands. Um, so a high signal of geographical speciation in these plants. Now, um, <clears throat> if you think about the analysis that I just showed you, you can say, well, you know, your analysis is a little bit biased towards the present because you are only looking at sister species. And when you look at the divergence of sister species, they're all going to be in the last million years. So you are not really accounting for a speciation that's happening in the past. Now, you probably know that the more we, deep, we go deeper into the past, the more difficult it is to infer morphology, infer geography. So even though there are some methods that maybe can allow you to go into the past, I really abstain myself from doing that. I just wanted to look at recent speciation. But I mentioned this clade, the denticulata clade, that has only species that are found in the forest and have pretty large leaves that we can see here. This event of um, uh, this, this group with bigger leaves suggests that there was an event of ecological divergence here in this clade where the star is. So at some point, uh, this ancestor evolved larger leaves, and then it actually went down from the paramo to the forest, which is really cool because um, biologists always thought, uh, the, the, the previous botanist that studied Linochius always thought that these species were the ancestral species, and then the paramo species were derived from the forest species, but it's the other way around. The paramo species were first, and then they went down slow and colonized the forest. So this single event of down low, down slow evolution indicates ecological divergence. We, when we compare these leaf areas as a group with the remaining leaf areas of all the other species, they are significantly different. Um, but again, in this case, we have only a single case that indicates ecological divergence. But this might have been really important because you can see that this ancestor with bigger leaves that was dwelling in the forest gave rise to many species that are now found in the forest. So in conclusion for this part, geography plays a major role in recent speciation. We have high signature of geographical speciation. And we can see at least from my study that ecological divergent events are few but perhaps they're really important and they can have a significant impact in the evolution of a group in time scales that are larger than a million years. Okay. All right, so um, I wanna stop here, I'm gonna drink some water, I'm gonna ask you if you have any questions before I move into the last part, yes. Um, yeah. I have no idea. That's that's a real puzzle because um, if you think about the age of the forest and the age of the paramo, so the Andean forest was there before the paramo because Andean forest was able to be there even if the mountains were not that high. The paramo only evolved five million years ago when the mountains reach uh, higher elevations. Um, so what I imagine, you know, the what I imagine it happened was the forest was already filled with species, but somehow some species of Linochilus became really good and at competing and went down, but I feel that uh, there were already species there. So what could have, I can explain maybe is that um, 
maybe the Andean forest has not reached capacity in terms of the species and they were able to colonize down there, but it was it was already an occupied system. And it's, it's really interesting to think why that happened. No idea. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yes, that's a great question. Um, yeah, the support for those nodes was pretty high. Um, I did this using SNPs in the genome and the bootstrap support for most of the nodes were 100%. But we know that the bootstrap support is sort of inflated when you use phylogenomic data. Um, so I will say I'm pretty confident about those, but I'm sure there is a little bit of wiggle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. My question was related to her, but uh, mm -hmm. you're clearly more interested in the speciation problem, but you have also like phylogenetic, very interesting problems to solve there. Yeah. <clears throat> Including the, the non monopoly of the first genus. Yeah. The name, mm -hmm. Because you named the low, low cost Linotilus, yeah. But there, there's another clay in red. Oh, yes. Did, but I noticed that. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, yes, that's, <laughs> that's an issue. So I'm going to go back for a sec just to explain that. Um, so I found hybridization happening between different genera. So Diplostethium hybridizes with Parastrephia. And when hybrids are going to be in weird places in your phylogeny, because they are going to have half the genome, half the genome of one species and half the genome of another species. And that's what's happening there. It's a hybridization. They're hybrids. They're hybrids. Yes. No, they are just real hybrids. Yeah, natural hybrids. Yeah. Great question. All right. Um, so I'm going to spend the last minutes of the presentation talking about uh, my work here, and this is work in progress, work that my students are doing here. And um, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the same methods that I use for my PhD to understand the origin, genetics, and um, biogeography in California endemics. Um, so here are some plants that we are studying. Uh, this is the California Floristic Province. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a little bit of my students are doing. So Ashley is working in Latirus by Florus, which is endemic plant to a single mountain top in Humboldt County. Um, I want to uh, thank CMPS because she got support from CMPS to do her project. And what Ashley is doing, she is sequencing multiple individuals from um, this population, the single population that we know of this Latirus by Florus. And she's trying to understand clonality in the species. So this species has a lot of, of asexual reproduction and we don't really know how many genetics, genetic individuals are found in the population. So by using next generation uh, sequencing, we're trying to understand how many individuals are there and we're hoping to use this information um, for conservation purposes. And that is Ashley. This is Kale. Kale is very passionate about violets. And if you have identified violets in California, you know that there is a lot of violets, um, specific populations that have not, are not well identified. And they have been lumped with a species in other parts um, of the world. So for example, we have this species, this individual here. Uh, this is the one that we have here in California. This is uh, close to Crescent City. This is was proposed, the Jepson says, this is Viola Langsdorfi. Um, but when you look at the next population of Viola Langsdorfi, this, the next population of Viola Langsdorfi is up in Alaska, I believe it's pretty far away. And we can see that there is definitely some differences between these two morphologies. 
Um, so what Kale is trying to do, they are trying to understand what is the actual um, close relative of this species. And it's basically testing if this name is correct or not. In addition to that, Kale is sequencing multiple individuals from this area. This is a rare species because it's only found there a rare population. And we're also trying to understand some of the genetic variability for this population. Eli is also one of my graduate students and we are working in collaboration with another botanist, Eric Lopresti, in understanding um, one species of um, San Verbenas uh, that is called Abronia villosa. Um, our collaborator, Eric Lopresti, made a preliminary phylogeny of these plants and discovered that this species is actually not a natural group, it's a paraphyletic group. And uh, we want to understand what's going on here uh, because if this is true, then it means that we have a different species that we need to describe and we need to conserve. So what Eli is doing, Eli is uh, sampling multiple individuals from different populations inside all these different taxa. And Eli is building a phylogenetic tree for all the different taxa. Uh, he's sampling up to 48 individuals in all these taxa to test the hypothesis and really understand what's happening here. In addition to that, Eli is very interested in understanding the speciation of these plants. So he's going to be doing some of the analysis, um, or similar analysis to the ones I showed you. And then Cameron. Um, he's right now an undergraduate student in biology, but he is about to finish and then he's going to be joining my lab. Right now, Cameron is working in building a database of species um, distributions for California. So um, Cameron is interested in looking at patterns of distribution for native plants of California. And we're building this database of filter occurrences that we plan to use to model the species distributions in California and uh, calculate what the extent of these different species, but maybe also in the future, um, try to calculate how these species are gonna be affected by climate change. Um, and then the last announcement I want to do is that I will be teaching advanced plant taxonomy in the spring. And this is going to be a class in which we're going to go to the field with my students. We're going to be collecting plants. We're going to be learning how to do surveys, how to identify plants. And um, right now I'm looking for possible places to do some of the collecting. If you have land, or if you're a land manager and you're interested in knowing what you have in your land, uh, maybe we can go to your land and collect the species that you have there and then identify them for you. If you're interested in doing this, uh, send me an email to ob20 at humboldt.edu. And with that, I want to thank uh, all the different institutions that have supported me throughout the years, all the different sources of funding, including the California Native Plant Society that also supported kale. I forgot to mention that. And I want to make a big thank to all the different herbaria that have uh, provided data and have supported me throughout the years. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Lots to think about there. And um, about people who want to ask questions, gravitate to the front of the room. People who need to leave, you're welcome to leave. Grab a piece of cake on your way out. And if you want to hear more about Ashley's and Kale's projects, come to our December evening program. They'll be speaking. Thank you for coming. Thank you.